Well, my name is Susan Christensen, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm grateful that you're here to learn about how to teach your children how to work and what things have worked for me. I have six children of my own, and the youngest just graduated from high school and got a mission call to Mexico City. So we're kind of excited about that, actually doing handsprings over and over because um, it's, been, it's been a great experience. But we're finishing up. But you guys are in the trenches, and you're here because you probably need some reinforcement and some encouragement. So we're going to talk about um, just different theories and things that I've done and things that some of my friends have done, and I'm just excited to talk to you about it. Have any of you heard of Clayton Christensen? Okay. He is a Harvard professor, was at the business school, and he's written some New York Times bestsellers, and he's also a fellow Latter-day Saint. He's one of us, and he's just really brilliant, and I love what he says about families, and he's, he's concerned about just how families that our children are doing less and less. And he says, in business, smart companies outsource everything. Like McDonald's, they, they outsource their paper products, so they don't have to you know, design them all and create them all. And so they outsource that, or they outsource whoever builds their buildings or their industrial kitchens. And we're doing that as well as families where it gets easier. And we've seen that with appliances getting more efficient, you know, like dishwashers and, and, and washing machines. And he said, it's just that pretty soon, these companies that outsource everything, pretty soon they're out of work because they have fewer employees and they're not doing the work. And that's kind of, he said, what's happening with families. And he said, really, all we do now is ask our kids to clean their rooms, and they don't even really do a good job with that. And he said, what's happening is the children used to work for the parents, you know, like 100 years when family farms and things. And now the parents are working for the children. And we hardly even want to ask them to help out. It's kind of like, it's almost easier just to do it ourselves. And so if our great-grandmothers were sitting here and our grandmothers, and it's kind of seeing the, the way that we're trying to parent today, they would probably feel sorry for us. It was probably just to be on a farm, even though it was hard, but it wasn't so much of this trying to create hard stuff for our children to learn how to do. And he said, what is the problem is our children aren't learning how to do complicated things anymore. And it's becoming, um, you know, they're a senior in high school and they're like, well, I guess I could go to work, but I don't really want to flip hamburgers. I want something that's a little more sophisticated than that. And, you know, that it's just this idea. And he said that parenting is probably the hardest it's ever been right now because of this outsourcing and our children not learning to do these things that they naturally learned. And he said, we have a whole generation that are kind of wrestling to figure out what they're going to do with their lives because they've kind of missed out on this structure that used to be automatically built, just kind of, you know, staying alive. So this is kind of what our problem is. And let me just read this quote from Neil Maxwell. He said, our Heavenly Father had described his vast plan for his children by saying, behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And Elder Maxwell goes on to say, consider the significance of the Lord's use of the word work. What he is doing so lovingly and redemptively is nevertheless work, even for him. He said, in fact, work is always, and I love this part, a spiritual necessity, even if for some, work is not an economic necessity. And so I thought about that. Why is work a spiritual necessity? And I remembered this experience I had, oh, I don't know, like 10 years ago. I met a guy, a man that had... Um, He'd been the director of London Study Abroad for six months. They go for six months. And I, I'm, I'm always fascinated with what people do. And I said, so tell me, like, what was the hardest thing about that? I mean, it sounds fun, you know, taking, just taking groups of college students to plays and museums and old ancient things. And, and he didn't even think about it. He just said, princesses. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, because it's mostly girls. There's a few guys, but evidently the, the bulk of the girls were the, for him. And he just said they don't keep their rooms clean. They drop stuff wherever they, they are in the lounge areas. He said even in the cafeteria, someone else is cooking. Someone else is doing the dishes. They wouldn't even take their plates to the cafeteria window where you put your dishes in. And he said they were entitled. They were, felt they were unique. They felt like the, the rules didn't apply to them. He said it was really difficult. And then you think about like your son marrying somebody like that or your daughter being like that. And you just think, oh, we've got to fight kind of this, this entitlement attitude. So anyway, I had a little bit of an issue when my parents were uh, taught us how to work. And like, for instance, I, they said, if you sew all of your clothes, so this is back in the 70s, I'm admitting it. But they said, if you sew your clothes, we'll pay for all the material because they wanted me to learn how to do that. 
And they said, or we'll pay half of your clothes and you pay the other half. So I thought about it and I said, okay, I'll try it. And my mom was a good seamstress, so she always helped me. So it was fun. I, I'm actually amazed at how much I sewed. And so I learned how to do that. That was good. We cleaned the house once a week. My sister and I were at the end of the family. My parents were kind of tired and they were just like, and so I wasn't being checked up on like they had with my older sibs, you know. And anyway, so I had a bad habit. When I would take off my clothes, I'd put them in a pile. A pile, you know, just shoop, shoop. And um, did this in high school, did this in college. In fact, at one point, there was a snake lost in our apartment. And guess where they thought the snake was? In my room. Which it wasn't, by the way, but it was in a little box in the utility. They found it like two weeks later. It was kind of creepy. But anyway... I had this problem, and so I remember marrying Craig, and the first week we were married, at the end of the first week, he handed me a hanger, and he said earnestly, if you will just hang up your clothes every time you take them off, like he was talking to a five-year-old, you know, and I was like, he said, if you'll just hang up your clothes while you take them off, then you will have a pile like this, like I've solved your problem that you've had for eight years, you know, and I was like, wow, my husband's trying to train me, this is embarrassing, I have these potholes in my life, you know. So um, those early years, so he had been well-trained. I mean, you know Grandma Papa. I mean, he had been well-trained by his parents. He had 10 teenage jobs to my two. My parents didn't want me to work. They wanted me to focus on my grades, which is a good thing. But he got the benefit of that work ethic, and it showed up like he didn't leave the toilet seat up. He, he not only didn't leave it up, but he knew how to clean the toilet better than I did. And so it was like, wow, how can I pass this on to my kids, even before we had kids? I thought, how can I motivate them when I kind of have these weaknesses and, you know, deficiencies? But I just thought, you know what? Um, I could just see how it blessed my life. I wanted my children to be good marriage partners. That was really my initial motivation. So I'm here to tell you I'm not an expert. But what I've done is I've gathered 32 years. I had my first baby in 1985, so now I guess it's 33 years of learning and nurturing and improving and making mistakes, and I'm bringing them here for you today. And hopefully they can help you. So... That's kind of where I am at. So here are the things we're going to talk about today. Family work is inside out work. Power storytelling. Heroes learn to work or dancing in orange pants. I bet you can't wait to hear about that. Create a you can do it map and the discipline of waiting. So family work is inside out work. So I was this young mother in the 90s and a professor at BYU named Catherine Slaw Bauer. She elevated my idea of what housework was. And because really, honestly, it's not being emulated or touted to the rooftops today, you know, working with your kids and, and making sure they learn these skills. And it was drudgery to me. And I'd rather read. I'd rather sit around and read and let things kind of fall apart. I mean, it was really a struggle. And so she said, you know, she had these great stories of her own family and growing up and what her parents taught her. And she said, there's, when you have a baby and you're pregnant for all those months and then you give birth, she said, all that sacrifice, you are bonding with that baby. And that's what work does when you do it. She said, it's not housework. When you do it with your children and you're trying to teach them, it's family work. And so I never called it housework again. And she said, that's sacrifice. And your kids learn that they're sacrificing. And she said, it just makes all the difference. And she said, plus, she said, we learned how to do so much. Our parents taught us so many skills that we've carried into our adult life. And that's been, that's that inside out work that you can't pay someone to teach your children to do. It's like, you have to do it. So anyway... I was excited to start, and so I started looking for ways to make family work fun. And so one friend of mine, she said, we do five from top to bottom. And so it meant they stopped at the top of their house, and in every room they'd put five things away, and it was a race. And she said, even my four-year-old can put five things away. And they'd race from room to room, and they'd do it in about 10 minutes. And that was something fun they did. Another friend, they used fake money, and she'd give it to her kids every day. Now, I know some of you have teenagers, and this works with the younger kids. I mean, you know, the teenagers are kind of past that. But I'm going to talk about your teenagers later. Anyway, she'd give this fake cash, and at the end of the week, they'd do a big fun thing. And if you're eating out all the time, it's not fun to go eat out. But for them, it was a big deal. And they would go get hamburgers with the pot. And they'd say, look, we all work together. We get to do this fun activity with the money from this week. And... And I loved how they worked together. Something that we've done, and it's become kind of an institution in our family. In fact, we still do it when they come home. Our college kids come home for family dinners. We do five-minute cleanup. And that's where somebody had the dishes every night in our family, but we would all help for five minutes. And so the person in charge would turn on the timer because it was most important to them, right? They were, in fact, they kind of became the policemen to make sure we were all working and weren't working themselves. You know how that is. 
But we would work and we'd get so much done in that five minutes. And then there'd be like a couple of pots left in the counters and they could do that. And so it wasn't like, oh, I have the dishes tonight. And it also didn't feel like work because we were all doing it together and kind of talking about other things. And I don't know, it was a fun thing. So one of our biggest successes was the hour of work. And um, I remember having a new baby in 1997, and it was summer, and I had four kids up to age like 11, and the new baby, and I was overwhelmed, and my husband traveled a lot, and I just looked around at the chaos, and I had this flash of inspiration. Because I'd been thinking about family work and, and, and how to make it more something we could do more consistently. So I gathered my kids together, and I'm a visual learner, so I had a bag of frozen peas. And I took out 24 peas and I put them in a row. And they're all just looking, they're just watching, you know, and I'm just concentrating. And so we figured out that we needed 10 hours to eat and sleep. So I took 10 of those peas away and I showed them 14 hours that they had to play with their friends or watch a movie, you know, it's all the fun. And I said, we need to work together as a family for one hour. Can you give me one of those hours? And, and recently, my son, who's now 30, said, I remember you put those peas out and you took one little shriveled pea and you said, this is the hour of work. It made me sound like an old granny or an old crone, you know. And, um, and I said, and I kind of laughed about it, but then I said to myself, but you remember the visual. You're still, you know, thinking about it 30 years later. It made an impression on him. So we did that. And my husband said, let's make it a more positive. Let's call it the hour of power. So, you know, we do that. We called it the hour of power. And so every day in the summer, we would work together every weekday. And they got to sleep in one day. And that was like, oh, that was the day. That was like a, and so when you kind of frame things like that, it's not like, oh, every day I get to sleep until one. You know what I mean? Especially with those older kids. And when my kids were younger, we started earlier and we'd do scripture study and prayer, do a little simple thing before we started that. And we got so much done. We'd defrost the freezer or we'd, you know, weed the yard or I don't know. It was just these wonderful things. And I really tried to have high energy, purpose, and praise because if it was just drudgery, it had to be something fun. We'd turn on the music. Someone always wanted to babysit the baby. You know, Cameron was our youngest. And they, they would kind of say, I'll take Cameron because that was the easiest part of the hour is to watch. That was the only time they wanted to watch him, of course. But... <laughs> Anyway, so we would, we would rotate from hard stuff like weeding in the yard, no one wanted to do that, to fun, like cooking, and then interesting, like putting their school papers in like those vinyl sheets. It'd be kind of interesting. So we would switch it. So it wasn't just like drudgery every day. But you know, you have those piles of papers that are important that you want your kids, that they, and they just sit there or they sit in a box. So we got through stuff and it was, it was awesome. And then as my the last two teenagers are growing up, I mean, who gets to spend an hour a day in the summer with their teenagers? And sometimes my son would put his music in and be like, oh, you know, I'm, not, I'm detached. I don't. And then my daughter and I'd be talking and he would answer over his music really loud, you know, and so he would still be kind of attached to us. But what they got to do is learn that precious skill of doing something they didn't want to do every day. And they knew, oh, if we just get started, we'll get through it. And it'll go quicker because we're all working together. And we've learned to fix up and clean up and sew. And I'm not talking, you don't have to sew a blouse, but sew them how to do a button or do a hem. I mean, some of these skills, you know, that they're going to pay somebody 15 an hour to do when you can teach them to sew on a button. We taught them how to finish strong and really be ready to launch. So it was just like, so many times they would say, oh, I put that on my application for this job that I did the hour of power and that, you know, I know how to work. And it just gives them this, this confidence. Another family work activity is family dinners. And Grandma and Papa, Karen's grandparents, my in-laws, were awesome. And they had such a structure, so it was fun and easy. They expected everybody to bring something, and then we all helped clean up. It wasn't this overwhelming um, you know, experience. It was just fun, and, and they had kind of trained their kids that way. And we as well became an important part of our family. And what we would teach our kids is to ask, what can I do to help? Because, you know, sometimes they don't know what to do. We're all busy. And, and so that's something, I think, an important skill when they're at somebody else's house for a dinner, to say, what can I do to help? Instead of sitting and visiting with everybody on the, the couch. So th this family in our board, the Boyces, Dave and Lisa Boyce, talked about this at a fifth Sunday lesson. And Dave wanted a big Sunday dinner with people coming to visit. And Lisa's like, are you kidding me? That's a day of rest. I don't want to do that. That's like, no, no. And so he thought about it. 
And he said, what if we made it really super efficient and made it so the kids knew exactly what to do? So he set up this whole system and it was like breathtaking. I, I, you know, I thought, oh, I wish my family wasn't grown. I would have tried this, you know? So they started like the three-year-old that would, they would put the ice cubes in the glasses for the, in, for the whole year. That was his only job. And then the five-year-old could set the table. And then they had different kids do the rolls and the potatoes and, and Dave would always do the roast. And then Lisa only did a salad on Sundays. And they moved quite a bit in their family life, like every four years or five years. And so this actually, this tradition helped them get embedded in their new neighborhood or their new ward very quickly because they would immediately be able to invite people over and get to know people. And Lisa said it became such a part of their family tradition that their kids wrote papers about it and how important it was and how grounded it made them feel. And they had this responsibility and they got really good at whatever that job was for the year. And they kind of got sick of the job, so they were ready to move on for the next year. And so I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of a beautiful example of family work. So working by themselves, I had a friend when I was talking about this with her, and she said, well, I grew up in a big family and I, I never liked working by myself. We always worked together, you know. And so we did have our kids do their individual jobs, and no more than four or five jobs, and just depending on their age. One of those jobs, though, for each child was vacuuming a room, and honestly, to have my house vacuumed every day when we had a dog, six children, and all their friends coming, I just felt like every night it was kind of like reset, or every afternoon when they vacuumed, it was like, okay, you know. Anyway, so that, that was a big deal. The other thing is, is that we ha have them return and report. So some kids are really good. We'd have, like their jobs on a page for five pages for the days of the week and they would just we had it hung somewhere because they'd always lose the individual piece of paper so it was just five days and we'd check it off and then they could do the whatever privileges we had which was like an hour on the computer or the, on a video game or something or watch a movie or go with your friends but the privileges i mean the work always had to be done and some kids are so good about checking off, and you have children that are so good and quick, and then some that you just work with them, and you work with them, and it's frustrating, and they just act like it's the first time they've ever heard this thing you've been doing for years. But honestly, I would think, if I'm not willing to work with them, who, who will? And that's the truth. And there's a big payback, because there is a reward at the end of the road, I'm telling you, for those kids that take a little more. I've had a couple that it, it has, and it's been worth it, because they have come up and come through and gotten better. Also, we did not give money for the family jobs. And this was just the way we did it. We just said it was that part of that sacrificing for the family. And so if they, they could always, always had little jobs, sweep the garage for a couple of bucks or do this or do this. And they could always do something. And so whenever we're at a store and they wanted something, you know how those things by the cashier, there's always stuff and the kids are always, Aah! and the parents are like, no, you know, I just would say, you've got money. And then I could watch them go, wait, I'm, saving that for that toy I want. Do I really want this, you know, this, you know gum that's gonna not taste good in five minutes? And so you get to watch that internal and they're starting to make those choices and they're like, no, nah, I don't want it. And you're, you're just like, great, that's great. And even I would say, if you don't have the money with you, because we had jars at home, saving, spending, tithing. I, I know you'll pay me back you could, and they would always go, no, it's okay, I'm gonna hang on to my money, which is so great for them to start working on. And I know you're probably already doing a lot of this. So I'm, I mean, you know, I just want, I know that you're already doing a great job. Okay, and the last thing of family work are family projects. And these were longer and they would take like the whole day. Or I'd say five hours, we're gonna take this, paint this room for five hours. And sometimes Craig would help me on those bigger projects and sometimes he wasn't there. But those big projects are a big deal. There was an article in the New York Times and they were just saying, do these big family projects and take on something that's, that is, you know, like making jam or doing the big yard thing or cleaning out the garage and make them all finished to the very end. And, it, and this is what these um, social scientists said at the Brookings Institute. They said, a growing body of empirical research demonstrates that people who possess certain character strengths like working hard, deferring gratification, or getting along with others will help them to do well in the labor market, school, family, and community. This evidence suggests that character skills may count for a lot, so all that grit that they're learning and as much as academic skills in terms of important life outcomes like career, marriage, and, and just getting along with people. So to me, that was such validation for what I've been trying to do. And I've seen that with Craig and, and his, his grit that his parents helped him with. It's a big deal because he didn't always have the best grades. But I knew that he would always succeed, and he did. And so it's that idea that sometimes school isn't their path 
but if you give them those internal structures of working hard and getting along with people and, and knowing how to work together, it's, it's, they're saying it's equal as those academic skills. Because a lot of kids have that academic skills, but they're missing those other big parts. Dr. Carol Zwick wrote a book called Mindset, and there's two kinds of mindsets in this book. And one is growth mindset, and one is a fixed mindset. Have any of you heard of this book? Okay. I loved her research and her um, hypothesis. So growth mindset is that you are not afraid to try hard things. That obstacles, you just know there's something to get through. And that um, you're not afraid to make mistakes. And then the fixed mindset, which you may know some people like this, where you're afraid to make mistakes, you kind of have a perfectionism thing. So if you're not gonna do well, you don't try. In fact, we were just talking to a friend last night, he talked about tennis and he kind of had a bad experience the first time, and so he never went again. Instead of saying, oh, I got hit in the face with a tennis ball, that's okay, that's a rare thing, I'm gonna go out and try again. So it's just this difference of a growth mindset where you're willing to try in a fixed mindset where it's, you're a little more careful and you just won't, like you won't try out for the school play because you might not get it. So as you do these big family projects, you're teaching your kids and you can say, wow, we have this big stump today. We rented a stump grinder. It's gonna be hard, but we're gonna grind it. And then the things break and you go, oh, we're not gonna stop grinding the stump. We're gonna go get a new blade and we'll keep working on it. And so that helps them to like, oh, it's not so hard to try out for stuff or you're just helping them with this growth mindset. The next thing I wanna talk about is power storytelling. His name is Dr. Marshall Duke. He's from Emory University, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. And he was asked to do studies of families. And he said they wanted him to kind of study family rituals. And he said, as I started looking into families, he said, all I could see, this was in the 90s, he said, were families that were falling apart. And he said, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. I think there's a bigger issue than just studying what family traditions are and family rituals. And he was talking to his wife, which is an, who's another psychologist. And she said, well, I'm working with these kids with learning disabilities, and the ones that are doing the, are the most resilient know a lot about their families. And so that really intrigued him, and he's like, huh. And so they studied 48 different families, and they came up with this questionnaire of do you know? And the questionnaire asked questions like, do you know where your grandparents grew up? Do you know where your parents went to high school? I mean, it kind of sounds ridiculous, right, and simple? But he came, they came up with this measure, and they worked on these 48 families, and they taped their dinner conversations, and um, they, they put the kids through a lot of, uh, you know, a bunch of tests. And they said that this test about how well the kids knew all these questions, and I have a copy of the questions I can give you after. These 20 questions was the single greatest predictor of this group of children's health and happiness, that these kids that knew all of this family information were they had this sense that they were bigger, there was something bigger than themselves. It wasn't all about them. And so Dr. Duke talks about, there's three different ways of telling these stories. So there's the ascending way, where you say, I came to this country and didn't go to school. Your father finished high school. You're gonna finish college. This is awesome. Or there's the descending narrative, where they said, we came and we lost everything during the Great Depression. And that's kind of like, oh. You know, and he said the best way to tell the stories are the, it's called the oscillating, like an oscillating fan, where you say, we came to this, this country and we built a business, but there was a fire that destroyed the business. But then we were able to gather as a family and rebuild the business. But then my wife got, your grandma got really, really sick and it was hard for many years, but I stayed by her side. And so just these different stories where it's like, we triumphed and then we failed, but then we triumphed, but then we failed, but we always grew and helped each other as a family. And he said the kids, he calls these children their intergenerational selves, where they kind of see where they are and that they feel like they have this whole team of people behind them that have experienced hard things and, and still made it and are still there for them and still love them. And I love this because at the end of this whole big study, he's like, we were blown away by this research. It's such a small thing, you know, to tell these family stories. And I love how it, it dovetails so well with what the church is trying to do with family search and how they're getting the teenagers excited about it and the children excited about it. And I love this scripture in Alma 37, 6. Now you may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass, and small things in many instances doth confound the wise. Just like that kind of confounded this 
you know, psychologists, like this simple act of telling family stories. Like, I don't know how many times you've heard Grandma and Papa talk about, Grandma was a sixth grader and she was walking down the street and Papa was a teenager, six years older, and he flipped her a quarter and said, give me a call, chick, when you get a little older. <laughs> and you can bet she had her eye on him for the next six years, right? And they ended up getting married. And I mean, I don't know, I, I never get tired of hearing it. They get this little twinkle in their eye, like, remember when we were young? And, you know, I love that. So I have two stories my mother would tell to me that carried me through actually trying to teach my children how to work when I felt like I wasn't that great. So Grandma Adams, so she lived here in Provo during the Great Depression, was raising five daughters. And her biggest goal, she, was a, she had a two-year teaching degree, and she married a cowboy, and he worked for Provo Utility. He moved up to Provo. So her father was a judge, and they'd been in an educated family. So her greatest wish is that her five daughters would have a college degree. And this is when there were no Pell Grants or student loans, and it was the Great Depression, and they were sewing flour sacks together to make sheets, and it was kind of an ambitious goal. And so by the end of her life, she had, so what she would do is she would buy an old house and all five daughters and her husband, they would fix it up and then they'd rent it to BYU students. And they'd all help and they'd all, and they were all working for this larger goal. And so it's kind of this, the oscillating where it was, I heard about the hard parts and the triumphs and the hard part, you know. And so she told this story, by the end of her life, she had 12 homes that were paid off. And it was just her quietly working, and, and her daughters all got their degrees. Some got masters. My mother got her PhD. And so it was just like, wow, during the worst economic time of this country when one out of four people were out of work. So that story helped me like, oh, working with my kids in the yard, I can do that. I'm not trying to, you know, make dinner out of nothing or clothe them with no, you know, there's no, nothing to buy. I have no money. So that was something that really stuck with me. The other story that my mother told me, about Grandma Adams was, because my grandmother was also very committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and she talked about, um, she'd be with my grandmother, and they would be looking for something for the apartments or the houses that she owned, and she'd say, oh, this washer, look, and look at the price, she goes, it's just what I need, she'd, and then she'd say, I'm so glad I paid my tithing, my mom would be a small girl standing there, and she said, my mother made it sound so necessary and fun, and like she was in partnership with the Lord on making things work in their lives. She said, I couldn't wait to pay my tithing. And so my grandmother would say that to her, and it went deep in her heart, and then she told it to me, and it went deep into mine. And I had that saying, I'm going to pay my tithing too, you know? And so it's these family stories are just so powerful. Okay, so our third one is heroes learn to work or dancing in orange pants. So in children's literature, there is, there's always a hero, right? It's usually a young hero who's inexperienced and not very strong, and they always have a mentor. Like Harry Potter had, is it Dumbledore? Okay, okay, you guys, I'm glad you hesitated because I hesitated, and that makes me feel better because I'm a little bit older than you guys. And Dorothy had the good witch Glinda, you know? Come on, Dorothy! You know how she had that voice? And, and so they have these heroes, or, or they have these guides or mentors, but the mentor never does the work for them. But they're there at the critical points when the, the hero is starting to fail or thinks he can't do it. Or, and so that's what you can do for your children, but you don't do the work of the difficult task. So here's an example of that. My daughter, as a sophomore, wanted to try out for student government. And she had older siblings that had done it, and that was kind of like, oh, if they do it, I did it, I could do it. And so she was looking it up on the computer, and all of a sudden I heard just this weeping at the computer. And I ran in there like, What's, what, where's the blood? And she's like, I missed the mandato mandatory meeting. And that was it for her. She thought, that's it. I've missed the first mandatory meeting. And I said, well, why don't you go and ask, find who the teacher is, find who the gatekeeper is, and see if you can still be a part. She's like, really? I said, yeah, just, just go try. And so she did. And she, that was the first tiny victory that she won. They let her try, you know, still be in the, the race. And I didn't have to go call the principal or go down and talk to the teacher. I, you know, it was a scary thing for her to go do that. So she did that. So then if I knew she could do that, that she could do the rest of it. And so it was three weeks of hills and valleys, emotional roller coasters. The next task that she had to do, the next quest, was she had to do 10 hours of trash cleanup at the school. And this is so it could thin the lightweights out, right? The 20 kids that wanted to run went down to like three with that, with the 10 hours. 
so she was doing that. It was like the end of spring break. We had to come home early so Sophie could do her, you know, the rest of her time. And, and we let her do it. We didn't go over at this point as a family and help her. That was her quest. She had to prove herself. And so we were there through the three weeks and we'd, she'd come home and be like bruised and sweaty and we'd kind of patch her up and wipe off the sweat and then we'd push her back in and she made it through the primaries and then, and then she, finally she did win this time. They don't always win and that's also a learning experience. But she won this time and we were shopping later in the week and she had found a pair of orange pants and the school colors are orange and blue. She said, look at these orange pants and she tried them on and she was in the... You know, just like, ah, and you can't, I wish I could bottle that. The anguish, the anxiety with the joy at the end, and the joy's worth it. And that's what the, your kids have to learn. But it's hard for them to have that growth mindset and keep saying, I'll try again. I didn't make it this time. This is what I learned, you know. All right. So the la number four, create a you-can-do-it map. So besides the hero, besides knowing how to work, and willing to do the work, he needs to have skills. And it's a superpower. And I heard this girl once, I was on BYU campus, and she wasn't very feeling very powerful. And she started talking about being dumped into adulthood, and I just kind of stopped and just kind of listened. And because she's being quite loud and quite dramatic. And she said, I am being dumped into adulthood. And I was like, hmm? <laughs> and she said, my mother-in-law just, so whoever she was talking to was being very sympathetic. But she said, my mother-in-law just called and said, the lease on the car has ended, so I'm going to have a car payment. And then she said, I'm going to have to start paying for my cell phone when I graduate in December. And then she said, and then my student loans come due when I graduate in December. So this girl was not feeling empowered by graduating. She was feeling like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not, you know, I'm going to be dumped into adulthood. And what was ironic for me is that the, she wasn't appreciating how long someone had paid her cell phone bill. How many years was that? You know, if you're 24 and you graduate, or 23, or the fact that she had free use of a car. It was more like, look what they're doing to me, you know, which is so interesting to me. Anyway, the thing we learned is satisfaction is a function of expectation. So when you teach your children not to expect anything from you, then whatever you do for them, they'll be like, wow, thank you. So we started with this map this you can do it map at the age, well, really at the age of three, we'd give them one job and, and they, you know, they would want to do it because everyone else was doing jobs. And, um, but when they were 12, this is when we started the map. And when they were 12, they would, this is when they started working for others and they would either babysit or mow a lawn. And you know what? I would take a 12 year old over a 20 year old any day. They're so happy and excited and they're wanting to, you can do this. We also have them start washing their own clothes. And that's a great, whenever I would pass it, like on our banister shirts that were lined up, I'd just be like, oh, I didn't have to do that. They're learning to do it. And there's a lot of people that are roommates or, you know, that come and stay with us that don't know how to, of my children, don't know how to do their washing. It's very interesting to me. And then the other thing that's kind of hard is they have to buy their own school clothes and pay for their own entertainment. And this kind of scares some mothers because you think, how is a 12-year-old going to do that? And I would buy them a bunch of clothes before they turned 12. And then I would find them things and say, look what I found on sale for $3. They'd be like, really? And I'd say, yes. You know, and so I, it kind of helped them with the clothing part. But just that expectation that they would have to start, it kind of made them square their shoulders and kind of, you know, get forth. And there's a lot of encouragement. There's a lot of um, patience, baby steps. At 14, oh, let me just say, I pay for socks, underwear, church clothes, because they don't care about those things. <laughs> I found that out. And uh, I pay half on their shoes, so they get really good shoes. I would pay for their sports stuff, because I didn't want that to be an obstacle, that they couldn't do sports. So they would be eager to do sports, because it was, it was, that was a fun thing. And I also paid for a first day of school outfit. But they really had this idea of, I'm on my own. Uh, at 14... They would get a five to 10 hour week, like one daughter worked at a wedding center clearing tables. Another son did, my friend ran a, like a home-based candy business and he packaged her candy. And then that's when my kids got a cell phone. And I know the cell phone thing, that's a whole nother, but we waited till they were 14 and they would buy the phone and pay for the phone bill. And that's, we tried doing the family plan and some kids were great about, about giving me their 20 bucks and other kids wouldn't. And so finally we just, everyone had their own phone bill and it was like 50 bucks. But that was like the beginning of their first bill. This is how bills work. And if you don't pay, guess what happens? And you don't rescue them. They don't have a phone, you know. At 16, they get a real paycheck. They're paying for their gas and their car. 
we would provide them like a crummy car, nothing really nice. But they would have to pay for their gas. And they would do their own fundraisers. So never, ever, ever take that hard thing away from your children where you say, let me take that list and call my friends. I've have, I see it all the time. Or I have kids email me and say, would you donate? And I'm like, come talk to me in person. Then I'd be happy to donate, you know? We'd pay half on school trips. So if the, the choir was going to New York, they would have to work really hard and pay for half of that. EFY, we would always pay for all of it because we wanted them to experience that. And they would also pay for the bad and the dumb stuff that they did. And that was hard. It was hard not to just come in and rescue them. We would do a Sunday night interview to help them if they were feeling like overwhelmed with all of these responsibilities. We also would do a zip date every week. And that was a half an hour and $3. And as they got older, it wasn't just a half hour. But that's a time where you find out from your kids one-on-one -on -one what's going on in their lives. And it is the most amazing thing. Every time we have a zip date with one of our kids, we're like, guess what I found out? Like, this is really a big deal. And through all this, we're trying to teach these character strengths of cleanliness, cooperation, focus, commitment, kindness, all those good things. I love this quote from Ryan Holiday. He said, character is a powerful defense in a world that would love to be able to seduce you, buy you, tempt you, and change you. So lastly, I want to talk about the discipline of waiting. This is so hard because we're such a fast food, fast speed. We, you know, movies have even changed. If you watch old movies, they take so long. They're, but we've just has sped everything up. And there's a blog called The Humans of New York. Have you ever heard of that? Some of you have. This guy photographs people, and then he tells a little blip about their life. And they're all different people, because they're all different people there. It's a very diverse culture. And this was one of my daughter sent this to me. There's a picture of a young woman that said, I think I need to learn discipline. I don't think I ever learned it when I was young. I had one of those typical inner city stories. My mom was addicted to drugs, so I had no bedtime, no wake up time, no chores to do. Those sound like simple things, but they aren't. I've seen a lot of people in college who are able to work really hard at something, even if they aren't very interested in the subject. And I think that's because they learn discipline. There's a lot of things you can do in your home for, to make children wait for things. They wait, like our kids had to wait to eat breakfast until their room was clean and they were dressed. But I'm hungry, just go clean your room and, and we'll be here. And, but it's, you know, you just keep encouraging them. Um, or we'd say the kitchen's closed for an hour before dinner. Or if they didn't save up for something, we wouldn't say, okay, we'll just get it. Because that's not building that self-discipline, that waiting. And then this quote from another psychologist, Martin Seligman, in his book, Flourish. If we want to maximize the achievement of children, we need to promote self-discipline. My favorite social psychologist, Roy Bowermaster, believes it is the queen of all the virtues, the strength that enables the rest of the strengths. I just want to finish with a story of one of our daughters. She was at BYU in the ad program and advertising, and their senior year, they have to do a portfolio that has five projects. And they work on that all senior year, and it's due January 27th of their senior year. So everyone else finished with finals, but Abby had to work through all through Christmas on this portfolio that was due. And she finished a couple of days early, and we were like, she said, can I have a double zippy with you and Dad? And I said, sure, and we went out to lunch. And it was so awesome. We just said, Abby, how could you have a couple of days before this big whenever? And she said, trust me, people are frantic. They're trying to get in there and get... And she said, and she turned to Craig and she said, you taught me my work ethic. And I was like, really? This is what I've been working for my whole life. I mean, I said that to myself. But it was really a payday. And she said, you, she said, I had to do this project with puppets and they were singing a song and I've never written a song before, but I just knew I could do it. And it was just such a payday. And I just thought of her. And then she ended up getting an internship and an ad agency. And then, you know, that was four months of nail biting. And will she get the job? And she finally got the job but it's a lot of hard work, but she did it. I didn't have to go down and help her with her term papers or with her project, or I'm not painting the sets that the puppets are gonna be. They did all of that. So I just thought of her babysitting at age 12 and then getting a job at age 14, calling on her fundraisers, calling the dentist on her own. I think I didn't mention that, that at 12 we have them call to make their own appointments. She did her, figured out her college classes. She went on a mission. And so it's like we handed her, prepared her for this plate of adult life. And it's like this magnificent changing of the guards where you're saying, you're in charge. It's a little worker bee becoming the queen of her very own kingdom. And it's just an amazing thing to see. And some kids do it in a short time, and some kids do it. It takes them a long time to figure that out. 
And that's part of our charge as parents is to have that patience and to be ready for that. So just, I just want to say good luck. Think of my grandma Adams working in her small corner of the world against impossible odds to get her daughters educated and teach them a testimony. And these are difficult times and it's not easy being a mother. And I just love God's plan of happiness where we're required to be families and to work with these kids. Some are so hard to work with and difficult, but your role is so important and I hope you feel that. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed, but just for me, learning about all of this stuff, it's the small and simple things like working with your kids, telling those family stories, not a, not you know making them do, not making, but helping them do hard things as your, their guide and mentor, and um, helping them with this map of this is what you do next, and you're, it's going to take you, and it's going to take us, and we're going to launch you together, but you have to work just as hard as we are. We're not the only ones working hard. Anyway, this, self, this inside out and the self-reliance, it's really worth it. I'm here kind of at the end, but kind of the beginning also in my family, and I just want to tell you it's worth it. And I hope that you, I hope you've learned something, and I really appreciate you being here. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. amen.